The NBA Finals start tonight. It's Thursday, June 1st. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Miami Heat are in Denver tonight for Game 1 of the NBA Finals. This is not the matchup NBA executives would have asked for from a ratings perspective, but it's the one they got. And now it's up to the league to bring this finals to a national audience. Joining us to discuss that task is front office sports senior writer Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. So um, first, let's touch on the ratings that we've had so far, which from my understanding have been pretty fantastic. So how have these playoffs done up to, to this date? Well, from since the literally since the play on tournament, the NBA has been on fire rating wise. Uh, right now, heading into Game One, they posted their most watched postseason in eleven years. Um, they're averaging something in the area of four point seven million viewers per game across ABC, ESPN, TNT, and NBT and NBA TV, and. You take a look at the Heat's dramatic game same win over the Celtics on Monday that drew a huge number, 12 million viewers. Yeah, yeah. So they've been doing great. Now they've got this finals between the Heat, who, you know, they, they've got a history. They've got some fan, you know, they, they've got excited fans. And the Denver Nuggets, who have never been to the finals before. No LeBron, no Steph, no Celtics. Um, how, how's the NBA feeling? If you could, you know, truth serum some executives now. Well, I think the NBA is feeling pretty good because there's a couple of reasons, and so is ABC. One, they've got momentum, right? It's not like the ratings have been down this postseason. In fact, they've been great. So they're hoping that that momentum will just continue uh, into the NBA Finals. And I think that uh, the idea that this is a boring series, an adult series, a little bit overblown. I mean, Nikola Jokic might be the best player in the world right now. And I think there's a lot of fans who are curious to watch him since the Nuggets are never on national TV. And the Heat have this great Cinderella story, right? They're giant slayers. They took down Giannis. They took down the Celtics. They took down the Knicks. You know, this team of retreads and undrafted players. So I I think there are some storylines going into this. And, of course, it depends on the games. I mean, if these two uh, teams come out, play the kind of basketball they're capable of, and we have tight, you know, well-played games with fantastic highlights. People are going to tune in, believe me. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited to watch. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, not many people can name a Denver Nugget other than Nikola Jokic, but they're a fun team. The Heat are, you know, uh, they've made it this far. They're doing something right. We've got playoff Jimmy doing his thing. So, yeah, I mean, the games themselves should be good. And, you know, uh, the NFL makes every Super Bowl exciting. I mean, it's the Super Bowl. Every You're going to tune in because it's the Super Bowl But it doesn't really matter who the teams are. Like, people tune in. And I think, you know, the NBA should be up to the task of getting people to watch this finals because the game should be good. Yeah. I I don't think the NBA is quite at the Super Bowl level. I I think the matchups still do matter. And I think the cities do matter. Uh, Right now, you've got a matchup of two mid-sized cities. I mean, Denver and Miami are the 16th and 18th largest TV markets in the country. So it sure would have helped to have New York or Los Angeles or Chicago in there, but you got to, you know, play the hand that you dealt. Yeah. And switching gears just for a second here, we've got some breaking news. You're just telling me that a uh, certain, the Warriors are not in the playoffs anymore, but one of their executives might be making moves. So what's the deal there? Yeah, we, uh, we just reported that ESPN is interesting hiring Bob Myers the two-time executive of the year and one of the key architects of the Golden State Warriors four-ring dynasty. Uh, Sources tell us, Owen, that the talks are very early on. You know, Myers, who just stepped down Tuesday, is probably going to be deluged with offers from other franchises. But, hey, he would be a nice feather in ESPN's cap. I could see him fitting very easily uh, into their studio game coverage. And don't forget ESPN and the Walt Disney Company are entering negotiations to retain their uh, NBA media rights. So having a a new splashy hire like that would certainly help. Yeah, one of the most respected executives in the sport. Mike McCarthy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Owen. Up next, we have Jason Kelly, host of Bloomberg's Next in Sports. Jason has a background in financial reporting, and we spoke about how a new wave of Wall Street money is shaping the sports landscape and where the investment dollars are going next. Here's my conversation with Jason.
Okay, I am joined now by Jason Kelly, host and executive producer of Next in Sports on Bloomberg. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, Next in Sports covers, you know, the intersection of courts, <laughs> sports and business and culture. Uh, what kind of stories are you looking for as, you, um, as, this, as you're shaping this show? Yeah, it, it's been really fun because we cast a, a pretty wide net and we like to think we have a very wide aperture, I guess, is another way to look at it. So it's, you know, nascent sports, things that are growing really fast, uh, new efforts by existing sports. So that could be, you know, soccer, football, uh, Formula One is something we looked into as well. But then, you know, we try and bring you things that either you've never heard of or, you know, maybe you've seen on ESPN in the middle of the night and wondered, is that really a sport? And how is how does all that work? You know, obviously, I'm in the same beat. And it's something where no sport is allowed to coast anymore. Like maybe like 20, 30 years ago, like if you're baseball, if you're football, you can just kind of do your thing. People are going to tune in. It's fine. Now everyone has to hustle and keep innovating and keep finding new stuff. Totally. I mean, that, that's such a good, good point. I mean, it, it, they've got to be innovative. They've got to sort of get to the audience where they are. I mean, that's gotten a little bit easier, I think, over time with social media and and whatnot. You can sort of find your find your niche. And then there are these sort of black swan, you know, macro events that happen. I mean, it, it was amazing doing the work on on this series, how often people pointed toward lockdown and COVID as a moment where they could kind of prove their mettle. I mean, cornhole being a really fascinating example of that, I think, where that was one of the only live sports that was on and, and ESPN essentially put it on main ESPN and the sport just blew up because people were so desperate to watch something, some sort of competition. And and now to this day, you, you've got cornhole just, it, you know, kind of taking the country by storm. Yeah, yeah. There's And it's funny, like, I feel like there's just more real estate uh, because we're so, the media is so fragmented, which is a challenge, obviously, especially if you're one of these legacy leagues. Um, but yeah, if you want to watch disc golf, you can watch disc golf. If you want to watch cornhole, you can watch cornhole. Like, you know, ping pong, like it's, it's all out there. So yeah, it's it's a fascinating time. And sometimes it's hard to know which one of these to take seriously. Because yeah, in the case of cornhole, like they're not necessarily taking themselves super seriously, but they're serious about trying to get you to watch. Absolutely. And you know, and, and what's interesting is, you know, you and I do this all the time, like from a business perspective, also figuring out, is this viable? You know, can people actually make money doing it, whether that is the owners of these nascent leagues, whether it's the athletes themselves? I mean, that was one of the really interesting things that my co-host, Vanessa Perdomo, and I came across was, you know, really getting to know these athletes because they're sort of putting it all on the line. You know, this is, you know, whether it's tech ball or cornhole um, or Athletes Unlimited, you know, these are these are efforts that you know, are very sort of soul and heart driven. Um but they want to make a living ultimately doing what they love. And, and sometimes that's happening and sometimes it's not. It, there are a lot of open questions there. And to, to pull on a, maybe a different narrative in this world. So you, um, for a long time, you were a Wall Street reporter. How has that background and just that knowledge helped kind of shape how you see the, the sports business world right now? Yeah, I love that aspect of it. I mean, it really is, you know, from a career perspective, as you more than anyone can appreciate, like takes a little bit of luck in this business. <laughs> and sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. You know, I was very fortunate to cover private equity in Wall Street at Bloomberg, you know, starting back in 2007. And one of the most interesting things that happened is all of these people that I got to know, you know, a lot of these very successful private equity investors have found their way to sports. So whether it's Josh Harris, whether it's David Blitzer, you know, who are partners in buying a whole bunch of sports teams, Mark Lazary, who just recently sold um, his stake in the Milwaukee Bucks, Tony Ressler. I mean, I could go on and on. And it's not just US sports, it's globally as well. So understanding kind of where the money comes from, I have found to be a very useful tool. And, and honestly, I kind of, I, I dare say, I sort of speak that language a little bit. And so I understand, I think, how they're looking at it or can at least sort of keep up as they're describing what the business case is. Yeah. And why do you think that is happening, that we're seeing so much private equity money, so much Wall Street money getting into sports just in the last few years? Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it's one of the biggest questions out there, right? I mean, I think part of it is just sheer opportunity these were, in many cases, assets that were, you know, sort of kind of bumped along for a long time. You know, if you look at the early days of the NFL, NBA, even, you know, going back 30, 
30 or so years, you know, the NBA in the early 1980s wasn't a very good business. You know, you, I'm sure you've watched Winning Time. I mean, it was like a, a kind of outback of a league. I think the media disruption has and, and sort of the media rights more specifically and the money that's there have really attracted a lot of that, um, a lot of that sort of smarter institutional money. I think when you package together media, when you package together the real estate that's often involved, again, this is sort of the playbook that these guys really understand. I think initially, candidly, they were drawn to it because it was kind of a cool thing to do individually. You know, you go back to O2, a group of private equity guys by the Boston Celtics, you know, that that was a really good investment, you know, a few hundred million dollars to buy an NBA team that's probably now worth, you know, upwards of four and a half, five billion dollars. And that that's like the story with basically every team right now. It feels like, oh yeah, these guys bought it for a hundred million dollars. Now it's yeah, two billion, three billion, four billion. I mean, um, uh, the Mets were sold what in twenty twenty one was it? And now the Angels are apparently got higher offers. Uh, you know that we're going on Artie Moreno's word there, I guess. But it seems like every sale is just like it breaks a new record basically every time. The Ottawa Senators are probably going to break a record. Yeah, I mean, the the command, the Washington commander is going for $6 billion. I mean, I, I think that if you had told anybody that a year ago, two years ago, much less 10 years ago, I mean, that is unfathomable to to think that um, that these could be worth that. And, and then I think that, you know, to, to further answer your question, I mean, the other element of this is that, you know, in some of these nascent sports that, that we're talking about, you know, you can sort of get in at, at a lower level, you look at um, you know, what's happening in the NWSL, for instance, the the pro women's soccer league in the United States, you saw franchise fees go from a couple million dollars two or three years ago for Angel City to now the Bay Area team. I doubt where you are. I mean, that that franchise fee is fifty billion fifty million dollars, fifty-three million dollars to be exact. So that's a that's a jump, you know, it's twenty-five X, at least on paper, in two years. And that's crazy. To, so you think about sort of that growth trajectory um, when you look at a, a wider aperture of sports. Yeah. And if we're talking about growth in sports, there's kind of no bigger realm than than women's sports right now. Um, what do you, is that just like because it's just the, the biggest untapped market out there? Yeah, I think there, there are a couple of things that are going on there. I mean, one, it, it goes back to this media question and, and access. Um, you know, when we were living in a world when when you and I were kids where there were, you know, a few networks and some cable channels showing sports, there was a very limited, um, limited opportunities for people to see sports. And so it was, you know, naturally concentrated on the sports that had proven to be successful. You know, now with social media, now with streaming, those sports are a lot more available. And one of the things you've seen, and this is what the the advocates for for women's sports really profess and evangelize and, and I buy into it is there is a little bit of it. If you show it, they will show up. <laughs> um, and I think you saw that with uh, March Madness this year, you know, the, the women's March Madness, the final brought in about 10 million people, the men's final brought in about 14 and change. So, I mean, that's, that's getting very close to, to a certain measure of parity and the, the sponsorship dollars have been very, very, very lagging um, when it comes to the women's side. So a lot of the folks who are investing there, they just see a, a tremendous upside. Right. I mean, that audience is catching up with, you know, a fraction of the investment. So yeah, you can, you can absolutely see the potential there. Um, to do a quick little lightning round, uh, just to get to know you a little bit better and see what else we can throw at you. Um, favorite sports teams? All right, so I'm an Atlanta guy, so I'm sort of Braves, Falcons, Hawks when when it comes to that, which is, you know, it, it, I mean, I guess Braves, it's been a little easier of late, but uh, Hawks and Falcons, a little bit of, bit of a tough slog. Even though I've lived in New York for 15 years, I, I always sort of go back south for my sports allegiances. Yeah, yeah. As a Mets fan, I have zero sympathy for, uh, <laughs> for Braves fans, just broadly in, in life. <laughs> um, um, all right, well, I guess this might be an easy one. Uh, biggest sports triumph and biggest sports heartbreak. Oh, I mean, 28-3, obviously, is the, the biggest sports heartbreak. I mean, I, I'll never forget, like, sitting in my neighbor's room and, like, watching Tom Brady uh, do the thing that he did. Um, I, I mean, sports triumph, I guess, would be, you know, my son plays college lacrosse now, and watching him sort of elevate his game to be able to play at the collegiate level, I think is probably one of my 
most proud sports moments. They, his team made the NCAA tournament this year for the first time since 1984. And, and that was just an amazing thing to witness. Yeah, yeah, very, very cool. And last one, under the radar sports narrative that we'll be talking about in a little while that we're not really talking about right now. I don't think we're talking still enough about NIL and how much it has, how much it is actively reshaping the world of sports. And I think we've seen a little bit of it, you know, come to come to play with, you know, big time football and big time basketball. Going back to what we were talking about with women's sports, I think it has had a profound effect on female athletes ability to make money both, you know, at the high school and collegiate level and, and beyond. And I think it's a little bit wild, wild west right now. NIL is, but even as it gets shaped, I think younger athletes being able to be compensated for their performance and for their notoriety is, is going to continue to, to change the way. And I think we, we don't fully grasp uh, all those implications yet. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think it's, you know, it's already starting to have effects at the professional level, even though that's, you know, it's a whole different ballgame. Jason Gelly, thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's been great. Thank you so much. Next in Sports began streaming yesterday on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg app, and connected TV devices. That's it for today. The thing I am most excited to watch in the NBA Finals, Nikola Jokic assists. Last night, I watched a video on the YouTube channel Thinking Basketball about how Jokic is one of the best passers in NBA history, and it helped me understand his value as a player, but also why the Nuggets are so good. If you'd rather see Heat content, there's also one of the, on the same channel about how Jimmy Butler turns into playoff Jimmy. Thanks for listening. Give us a rating or review or tell a friend about the show. We will see you tomorrow. <laughs>